Okay, we'll get started here. Uh, my name is Kevin Frisch. I'm uh, currently CMO of WAG. Um, and uh, I've only been at WAG for about three months. And before that, I was at Uber. And I was responsible for uh, customer acquisition and retention for, the North, for North America. So what I'm actually going to be talking about today is um, kind of my journey at Uber uh, when it came to trying to sort of think about how to trade off uh, acquisition spend versus incentive spend. And it started because, you know, I was at Uber, you know, it was Uber, so you're spending a lot of money on acquisition. And yeah, I'm doing my thing, drivers, riders, oh, how much does it cost, this channel. And kind of, you know, there was this other group that was spending actually more than I was. As a, as a marketer, you're like, I should be spending the most of anyone. Um, more than I was, you know, this marketplace group doing all this stuff. And I was like, huh, this is interesting. I, I wonder how, as a company, we sort of allocated the spend between these two groups. And so what I'm going to talk about is sort of the process myself and some folks on the marketplace team went through to try and figure out how to sort of bring these things together. Um, just a quick note, I actually stripped most of the numbers out of this. Uh, <coughs> some friends at Uber Legal told me to do that. Um, and there are some that are in here, but they're just, they're kind of made up. So don't, you don't need to sort of take out your notes and be like, oh, that's what their cac -to LTV ratio is. Oh, now I know what to do. So don't, don't, don't do that. Um, okay, so let me um, kind of, just some basic definitions down. Uh, acquisition spend, you know, typically, whether it's online or offline, uh, I'd toss referral, referral spend in there too. Your job is to basically, you know, bring on new customers. Uh, I would exclude brand spend from that. This is like where you're directly bringing on new customers. Uh, acquisition spend controlled by marketing. Uh, the kind of goal is growth. And the main way you're measured in your key KPI is CAC to LTV, right? This is kind of no nothing new here. Um, a few things I want to talk about, and these will be relevant kind of for when I talk later in the presentation, so pay attention. Um, LTV, obviously, we all know what that is. It's basically the sum of the sort of the variable contribution margin over the uh, lifetime of a customer. Uh, and you can measure it, you know, 12 months, 18 months, 6 months, 36 months, whatever it is. Um, two things that are kind of relevant kind of at marketplace companies and uh, at Uber, I would say. Uh, the first is that um, it's a little tricky to sort of allocate LTV between kind of the supply and the demand side, right? Like, okay, you bring on a new driver, they generate $100. Well, you can't assign all that entire $100 kind of to the driver because you also have to have passengers in that. So you have to figure out how to allocate the LTV between those two things. Um, another issue is that, you know, not everything is incremental. You know, a driver kind of did 100 trips, which one of those would or would not have happened if that driver had not been on the platform. So there's a few kind of things that make LTV a little difficult to understand. Um, the second thing is uh, that's relevant is LTV kind of the way Uber calculated it and the way kind of most people do doesn't necessarily account for kind of the benefit that that additional customer brings you towards getting towards the nirvana of ultimate scale and dominating the market and having this amazing network thing. It's usually a calculation of like, okay, here's the cash flows I'm going to get from this person. Oh, we'll probably improve our customer service a little bit, so it'll probably be a little higher, right? But it doesn't sort of account for that sort of winning in the network effect sense. On the CAC side, uh, this is one of my favorite topics I'm not going to talk about for long. There's three ways of measuring CAC. There's blended CAC. All of your spend divided by all of your new customers. Okay? Then there's paid CAC, which is kind of, OK, all of your spend divided by all of the customers you think that that spend brought in. So it ex excludes kind of the organic and the untracked from the cal calculation. Uh, and then finally, everyone's favorite, marginal CAC, which is what is the cost to bring on a new customer kind of of the last dollar you spent, like the last dollar, how efficient was that? And if you think about kind of these different uh, measures of CAC, obviously sort of marginal CAC is the most expensive one. And, you know, when you're kind of figuring out, you know, when you have a CAC to LTV target, you know, often people argue, oh, should it be 12 months, should it be 18 months? The bigger conversation you need to have is what sort of CAC are you actually measuring? And this is all for context, because when you start to compare it to what the incentive guys do, everything got a little scrambled. So uh, on the incentive side, OK, so the incentive team or the marketplace team, uh, they're spending to sort of drive additional activity from current users, OK? Acquisition, bringing on new users, incentive. 
uh, bringing on you know more activity from current users, supply or demand. Now, what's interesting is kind of that team's goal was either market balance, which I'll talk about in a little more, or just generally getting more scale, just kind of more network, more, more power. Uh, it was controlled by the marketplace team and the ops team, which are separate from marketing. Um, and the way they measured is how much spend to get kind of extra basis points of category share. Okay, like how much do we need to spend in order to be 75% of the market versus 76% versus 74%. So that's kind of the mentality of, um, of that team. And uh, when it comes to sort of the market balance, you know, there's a, a few ways they could spend their money. The first is what we call sort of, you know, the, the micro balancing. So, hey, there aren't enough drivers in the mission on Friday and Saturday night. Like, we all know this is true, right? And so, hey, let's offer extra money for drivers to drive in the mission on Friday night and Saturday night, right? That's sort of like, you know, the market overall might be fine, but man, we have this problem in the mission at this particular time. And then there's macro imbalance, which they could also address by like, hey, San Francisco is another good example here. There just aren't enough drivers in San Francisco. So the whole entire market is out about too many riders, not enough drivers. That's why you have surge, obviously. Um, but hey, let's just sort of offer the drivers more to get them on the road more. Uh, other cities actually have uh, too many drivers and not enough riders, which creates different problems. And the, ri the drivers are all mad at you because they're not making enough money and they kind of protest outside your office and things like that. And then kind of the third thing they do is, like I said, just scale. Hey, maybe the market's in balance or more commonly, the market's out of balance. We can pay sort of drivers to sort of get them in balance. And now let's sort of pay both riders and drivers to do more. So we give discounts to, driver, to riders, pay drivers more just to get more activity in the market. And this isn't ridiculous, right? When you kind of are thinking about a network business, it's like, hey, if we have more activity, then you know, you know, Uber pool will work better, the pickup times will be better. So it, it, it makes sense to do these things. Um, the key thing to note here is, unlike a typical you know, CRM campaign, which is gonna try to drive kind of additional margin or look at ROI, okay, we offered 20% off on you know, shipping and we got this many orders, but we lost this much margin. The way this team thought about it, again, wasn't on that short-term ROI perspective. It was more on kind of how are we sort of hitting these big metrics in terms of category share. So, you know, so we're sitting there, it's like, okay, Acquisition spend can't necessarily do anything with micro imbalance, but if we sort of spend more on drivers in a given market, we can help with the macro imbalance. We can sort of bring on additional drivers, so over time there'll be more drivers. And same with scale. If we just want more of everything going on in San Francisco, we can just kind of spend more. Um, there were a couple of issues with that. So, so this is like, okay, we should be able to then move money between these two groups, right? Who can get scale most efficiently? Who can sort of fix the macro imbalance most efficiently? But there was no mechanism to do that, not even like anything. Uh, first, the KPIs were different, like I mentioned, like we were just measured on different things, viewed the world entirely differently. Um, so it was really hard to sort of compare the effectiveness. Uh, the other thing that happened is ownership was completely separate teams, like marketplace, ops, they're in product, marketing, physically a different building. Like who wants to go to that other building? That's the weird building. We're in our cool other building. So a lot of disconnect there. And you realize kind of how weird it gets when, you know, there's sort of a budgeting process and the marketing team, the acquisition team is like, hey, extra million dollars, I can bring on a thousand new cu customers at a CAC to LTV ratio of 2x. And then the uh, marketplace team says, hey, for an extra million dollars, I can get us 100 basis points of additional market share for next week. I, I, I have no idea kind of how to compare those things, like which is the better investment, right? So what we try to do is like come up with something that would allow us to sort of have some sort of apples to apples comparison. Um, and that was marginal cost per incremental trip. So, um, that sounds sort of easy. Maybe it doesn't sound that easy. Uh, okay, it sounds hard. And it was, okay, it was. Uh, so the first thing is like, okay, on the acquisition side, it's so like, okay, let's figure out our increment, how many trips we drive. And, and that, that shouldn't be hard because, okay, we bring on a new driver. We know they, let's say, do a thousand trips over their lifetime and it costs us $2,000 to acquire them. Okay, so that's $2 per trip. 
that seems fairly simple. And the marketplace is like, no, you idiots. Like, you're thinking about this all wrong because which, like I said, which of those trips are actually incremental? Like, yeah, that driver did a thousand trips, but how many trips, like, did that driver enable? And if the driver had not been there, how many fewer trips would have been? It surely wasn't a thousand, right? So we had to figure out a way to sort of kind of really understand the incremental trips. And the way we approximated that, uh, all these things seem so obvious now, is we said, okay, let's look at when these drivers drive and then look at the points when they're driving when there was basically surge, when there was supply constrained, and only sort of count the trips that the driver took then as incremental. All the ones they sort of did at like 3 p.m. on a Thursday don't get counted as incremental. So then we said, okay, this is how many incremental trips um, are driving. Um, on the incentive team, they, their entire world was around incremental trips. Like they knew, they had these amazing models that perfectly calculated, okay, if we give this extra money in the market, um, you know, this is exactly how many incremental trips we're gonna get. Uh, one caveat, because I think it's kind of cool. Normally when you do a split test, it works pretty well. You have your test, you have your control, you give these people extra incentive to drive, and you look at the delta. Uh, and so, hey, that's the lift. In a marketplace company, your control moves down, right? If I give a bunch of half of drivers, hey, here's extra money to drive more, they drive more. They actually take away demand from the other drivers. So if I look at test and control, the gap isn't that big because my, te my, my testing basically impacted my control. So even the marketplace team had even figured that out. They had adjusted for that. So they knew this perfectly well. That's why they have the happy face. On the marginal cost side, uh, you know, we were pretty good at marginal cost because we had this media mix model, uh, which we had been working on for, well, for about four years. But the good version of it was only for the last year. Uh, and we knew kind of by channel in total kind of the efficiency of the last dollar we spent. So kind of we had that pretty easily. The marketplace team had a really interesting calculation um, for this. And it actually took us a while to understand this. As a marketer, when you say, okay, I spent um, $100 and that brought in 10 trips, it's $10 per trip, right? Forgetting this whole you know, incremental part, um, that's $10 per trip. When the incentive team calculated that, they said, okay, we spent $100, we brought in 10 trips. The typical margin on a trip is, let's say, $2. $2. So we're going to subtract that $20 of margin generated from the $100, and it's $80 that we spent to get 10 trips. So that was $8 a trip. It's fine. Like th that's, that's kind of, for that part of the business, how it made sense to think about it. But again, it made this sort of incompatible. So we had to kind of, kind of create this new kind of cost per incremental trip metric, which was different from the one they had been tracking all this time. So um, we did all that. And of course, I'm only here because uh, the marketing team won. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was significantly more efficient, it's like not by double digit percentages, but by you know, triple digit percentages more efficient, like by, uh, you know. And uh, that was kind of exciting. We're like, wow, <laughs> there's this, this opportunity to do this. Uh, before I sort of talk about kind of what we did, um, I wanted to sort of just recap sort of how we got here. Uh, the first one is marketing was held to, again, this is Uber, a, a reasonably rational CAC to LTV, right? Um, and that made sense because you don't want to sort of have a CAC to LTV that's whatever, 10x, that doesn't make any sense. And if you're in a growth company, maybe your CAC is higher than your LTV, you'll, you'll let that go for a little while. Uh, but marketing was held to that as, as well we should have been. Um, the other thing, then compounding that a little bit, uh, is that, oh, sorry, and for the incentive team, there wasn't a natural kind of benchmark of CAC to LTV that you could compare it to. When, when like, if I say, hey, I'm spending 2X CAC to LTV, someone could say, yeah, that's a little high, you know, the company I had, we did it kind of a 1.5X, we used the 18, you can have a conversation about it, right? And, and there's sort of benchmarks out there. Uh, wow, I thought I'd be going slowly. Okay, five minutes left, I'm gonna talk faster. Uh, but when you're in sort of an incentive world and someone says, okay, how much do you want me to spend to get an extra five points of market share? 
there's no kind of benchmarks. There's no sort of things out there to understand what's that worth. So the marketplace team didn't have this natural constraint that we did. Um, the second thing is, because I felt we were spending CAC to LTV was too high, I had actually taken down that ceiling when I joined. And I thought that was, oh, I'm so good, I'm so nice, I'm thinking big, not trying to increase my budget. But what it turned out that happened is then we acquired fewer riders and drivers, which meant that six months, a year down the road, the incentive team, which remember is spending money less efficiently than we are, kind of is having to boost more incentives in those markets. So I sort of compounded the effect. Um, spend was managed by different groups. I think you know, this is kind of an obvious problem. Um, the two other things that were interesting is our trip category per share, um, trip category share was obsessively tracked by Travis, like daily, not weekly, daily. Like you didn't know you could get this information daily, but you can. Uh, and that's, you know, what is it? How does it compare? What is it in different cities? The kind of share of acquisition, like, you know, how our app is ranked in downloads versus competitors. You know, I sort of looked at, but it wasn't sort of this hero metric that was tracked throughout the company. Uh, and finally, interestingly, there was this optimism that this high level of incentive spend would go away soon. You know, it's just going to be for another quarter or two. And so if that's true, you wouldn't want to acquire people at a super high cost, you know, because, okay, well, incentives are so expensive, I'll acquire at a super high cost, because like, well, if we're only doing incentives for another couple of months, then you're going to acquire people at a super high price with a two-year life, you're kind of overpaying for it. Um, so those were kind of, kind of how we got here. Um, so, okay, so let's back up. So now we have common measure, cost per incremental trip, and we have an understanding of the efficiency. Two things we still had a problem with. Acquisition can't impact the near term, right? Uber, big installed base. Uh, I could spend, I could 5x my acquisition spend, and it would not change anything this month. First, it took a while for drivers to come on, but even so, just a large, large installed base. You, we just can't move that that quickly. Whereas incentive spend, bang, they put that money in the market, drivers react that same day. Um, and second, we can't address micro imbalances. I've, uh, you know, trying to sort of, you know, acquire drivers who only want to drive in the mission on weekends. I tried. It's, it's hard. Turns out not so easy to do. Or getting riders that don't want to sort of get rides kind of on the weekends too. So what we ended up doing, this graph looked better on my, my computer, uh, is we said, look, we are going to look at the three types of spend, micro imbalance, macro imbalance, and general scaling that the incentive team is, does, right? And what we're going to do is sort of take money from future quarters, not the next two quarters, because remember, marketing can't really do much in the near term, but from future quarters and look at the, efficient, the comparable efficiency and basically look, how much money can we move from what quarter such that the incremental trips that marketing is driving kind of in that quarter will make up for it. So, okay, so in Q4, let's say uh, the incentive team was going to spend so much money on driving incremental trips and at an efficiency of, you know, they're going to drive 100 new trips with this particular money. So if we move that money into marketing, into Q1, will our spend be able to drive those 100 incremental trips in Q4 if we bring on drivers and riders right now? And so we use that logic to sort of reallocate sort of future money into the marketing bucket. Uh, and it actually worked. It was kind of cool. And it kind of brought these things uh, a little bit in line. So this is my last slide. So, uh, you know, lessons learned. I, I think this is relevant, like, as you sort of start to do marketplace spending. And I think, you know, most companies start with just acquiring kind of on the supply and demand side. And then at some point you need to adjust. I would say make sure to think about what your true LTV is. If you're a marketplace business, it's not the cash that you're getting over the sort of the immediate lifetime of people you acquire. You're presumably there's some benefit to scale, some benefit to winning in the market. Make sure to at least try to think about that when you come up with your LTV, because if you don't, you're going to be under investing and you'll probably end up sort of spending more money to try and basically catch up by using sort of less efficient um, incentive spend. Um, also, always think about your costs on the margin. Like using kind of average CAC, average paid CAC instead of marginal is just death, right? Because there's all sorts of weird games and discrepancies you can have if you're not always thinking about the margin. It's fine for your goals, your overall goals to be, hey, we want our average CAC to be this. 
But when you're deciding on a particular channel, put the money here, put the money there, move this, it all has to be on the margin. Um, the next thing is make sure there's a common metric. When you're starting, uh, when you're starting to kind of compare these things and when you're starting to build up these two teams, make sure that they all have at least one metric that's shared so that when you do have to move money back and forth, you have that metric and don't have to spend, it ended up being, this whole process I took you through was six months, right? That, that's how long it took to sort of get people aligned. So the more you can sort of build that into the foundation, the better. Um, and finally, create a mechanism to move that money around, whether it's you put it in the same team, which again, the teams are kind of very different, or just have there be part of a process, someone from finance who is constantly looking at, okay, what's the efficiency of this versus the efficiency of that, and kind of being able to move those monies back and forth. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes. Or if you're increasing your CAC, but you, or you have a great incentive, and your CAC could actually decrease. And how did you guys all that lie? Yeah, no, it, it, was, it was true. The, so basically, the incentive team kept saying, hey, the incentives we're spending kind of are actually increasing your lifetime value. And I was like, well, actually, that's not true. It's decreasing it. But trying to figure out by how much it's decreasing, especially when it came to sort of the incremental trips, it wasn't that hard because once we sort of got to the point where we understood the cost per incremental trip of incentives, we basically could sort of adjust kind of the lifetime trips and the margin that sort of was being generated by LTV. So we sort of did it on the back end. So you could say, okay, 15% of trips are being generated by incentives. You know, each one of those is costing us X dollars. So we can subtract 15% of lifetime trips and throw back in the margin that those that we overpaid for those trips for. Go ahead. Right. money brought in from that transaction. How else do you view, like, how do you go about viewing value pulled in for LTV outside of just that? Money? What we attempted to do, and we, we I didn't get far on this, uh, was really sort of say, okay, kind of at scale, kind of what are all the things sort of we will be able to do? Oh, it unlocks Uber Pool, it does these things. And then what we attempted to do is sort of put a value kind of on that and then divided that through by sort of all the new customers and sort of assigned chunks of that value to LTV. A very imperfect and probably could be done a lot better method. And I guess my point is just try to do something to account for that. Can you talk a little about how Uber strategically selected the actual LTV CAC number um, as, a, as a mechanism for growth? I know you're blinding that number, but just like what, what went into the decisioning of having it be two or three or Um, I don't know that there was a ton of logic to it, quite frankly. Uh, when I got there, basically it was, here is a pile of money for marketing. Spend it as efficiently as you can. There wasn't, like in most modern marketing departments, it's like, okay, you can spend as much as you want. Just make sure to sort of have it be this efficiency. Uber was not set up that way. Right? Uber was set up like, here's a pile of money, spend it as best you can. So there wasn't really a logic, which is why when I came in, I was like, I sort of did the math. I was like, okay, this, this CAC to LTV is out of control. Kind of let's bring it down a little bit. Yeah. You gave the example of the incentives driving 100 additional drives or right. in Q4, and then you could drive is that more effectively by pulling that, that yep. doll those dollars back. I'm curious what the instances were in which incentives actually were more efficient or were they not? And where did, where did you achieve a balance or was it just actually this was an ineffective use of dollars? It wasn't, it was, there wasn't a whole lot of movement going the other way uh, because we weren't trying. So for example, if we had been trying to use acquisition to sort of fix a micro imbalance, that would have been an example where money would move the other way, but we weren't, right? As it happened, it was mostly that um, kind of the incentive team was using money that was less efficient. So all the efficiency moved the other way. All right, thank you. Thanks, Kevin.